We now have uh, Susie the Geek with us, and you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and your kidling, and we will jump into our quick bite on how to raise a geek. Hi, everybody. I'm Susie, and these are my kids, Kevin and Amanda. You guys say hi. Hi. <laughs> and they're being a little camera shy today, but that's okay. We usually do audio, so this is kind of a fun adventure for all of us to jump in and do this, but um, we knew you guys were working really hard today, so we wanted to jump in and give y'all a little help, a little assist on doing this. So we thought we might talk about some of our favorite things in kind of science education. We're kind of flying off the top of our heads because, you know, kids, they like to do that. And uh, so we're going to talk about just some fun stuff. and. So, hey, Kevin, what is your favorite area in science to study? Life science. What kind of science? Life science. And what does that include? It includes, like, studying about animals and plants and lots of other things. <laughs> so one really interesting thing about studying animals and plants is that has to do with space is what would they be like on other planets? Definitely not, well, probably not like they are on Earth. So, how did you get an idea of what they might be like on other planets? Well, lots of fiction <laughs> shows and movies and books, they all describe animals and things to be like, uh, sci-fi, to be like the animals on Earth, and I don't think that would be very, very accurate because... If it is another planet, the places would be different. And wouldn't that mean they'd be different to adapt to their area? I think so. I think they would be very um, differently kind of shaped and have all kinds of arms and legs and, and wings and things designed for whatever environment they grew up in. Now, there's a game that you've played that helped you kind of figure out what kind of creatures needed to be in what kind of environments and what game was that? Spore. Spore. And in Spore, Spore, what could you do? You you basically make your own animal and you make it smarter to where it's this super advanced race where they're out in space like the highest level is you're flying around in space and going to all these different planets and stuff. It just ruined my role, man. <laughs> You start out as a cell, and you don't do very much, like, in the water, and you grow to adapt to land, and you you do so tribal so civilizations, and then from, you, you just keep getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. So you learned a lot about how maybe life on this planet developed and how life on other planets would develop. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you had a planet that was just covered with water, what kind of creature do you think would live there? Maybe a sea slash air animal. Mm-hmm. And what kinds of things? Would they have flippers or wings or they probably what kind have of stuff? flippers in uh wings. They would probably just live in water though, because there was there was no land there'd be no like resources to get from being out of the water. So how would they get around? What kind of shapes and stuff do you think like they'd have? Flippers well, and webbed we feet. Don't really know what kind of shapes they'd be like and we can't really imagine it. No, you can. But you can come up with some ideas based on the way things are shaped here, right? You could come up with some Ooh. ideas. Now, of course, truth tends to be stranger than fiction, so there's no way we could imagine all of the stuff out there, but we could get an idea from it. And that's one way we can have a lot of fun with science is playing a game like that where you can kind of come up with your own creatures and stuff. Build your own world. What's another fun thing you can do? Now, there's some stuff that we have gotten supplies to do that we haven't gone out and done yet, and that's building our own rockets and shooting them up. Is that something you guys what? would like to do? Well, we've got, we've got model rockets. We just haven't fired them yet. You guys actually, oh. didn't you guys get them more for Amanda than me? Cause I don't, we I'm got them really for both interested. of you. Don't worry. I'm not really interested in that. Well, what could you put on it that would make it interesting? I don't know. Do tell. Could you put a camera on it and let it take pictures when it got all the way up in the air? I've already seen that kind of thing. You've already seen that kind of thing. <laughs> I've been in a hotel before. Isn't yeah, but you haven't close? been in a rocket ship, have you? Why would I? 
Why would I be in a rocket ship? No, I'm just saying. You haven't seen what it looks like from a rocket ship. That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Yeah, that'd be cool. Well, how about you tell me an experiment you would like to do? Some way yes. that, something that you would like to do so you could learn um, science just by doing it rather than just reading about it or hearing I, about it. I don't actually know a project I would do for that. Well, if you wanted to study animals, would you want to go out and get some animals and raise them? Like I did growing up on the farm? Yeah. And probably. what kind of animals would you like? I would like, like, maybe... <laughs> You're not saying anything. I don't know. We'll talk. Um, <laughs> this is the fun part about having kids on a live video is you never know what they're going to do. I don't. I don't know what animals I'd have. Amanda didn't give me enough time before she pin punched pin pinched me. Amanda, do you have any ideas for an experiment maybe you'd want to do or something you'd want to try? Not for that. <laughs> what about for anything? Anything science? Wait, what are you talking about? Here? Anything sciencey? Any kind of experiment or something you'd want to do? I don't know. I just want to play Skylanders. <laughs> they want me to let them go and play Skylanders, which is what oh. they were doing with their dad for Father's Day. And I want to finish. Well, you were playing. He was like, "I don't want to do this," even though it was his gift. I played a little bit with you guys, and you guys kept being overpowered and killed me all the time. You're not good at it because I never played it. Yes, you, you guys are way overpowered. And I don't. I barely even know the controls. <laughs> Just what you wanted to tune into to the Google Hangout for hearing the kids <laughs> argue. <laughs> That's pretty silly. It's all man's fault. Well, do y'all want to say anything to Nicole before I let y'all go? Because they have been working really hard all weekend. And did y'all want to say anything like, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, you for working so hard. hard on the show. <laughs> conquering the world is easy. <laughs> I did it. Let's do it. They work very hard, and we definitely appreciate it. And if you guys aren't aware of what Cosmic Quest X does, you should definitely check it out. If you're at Dragon Con, you should definitely come by the booth because Nicole, mm -hmm. Pamela, everybody's there working really hard. And even this ki these kids, jaded with their video games, found something fun and interesting to do at the website. Excellent. Are you rolling your eyes? Yes. <laughs> well, it's a little bit like a game wow. of film, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, Jaded okay. with their video games. I know. You guys are funny. Wow, Mom. Seriously? <laughs> That's just cool. Okay, I'm going to let them go and play, That's and we can cool. move on. That's All right, you good. guys go play. You're mean. Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, so, Tim, <clears throat> Tim, if you can send in Carrie as well. Um... Send Carrie along to the Hangout, and then tell Corey, our programmer, you know who he is, <laughs> um, to print the cards. Uh, Corey, if you're watching, to print the cards, uh, if you can, that uh, I emailed to you. We have Cards Against Astronomy coming together, thanks to Ryan. Uh, so, Tim, please get the message to Corey uh, that uh, we would like those printed. Um, or if he's not around, then we can get you to print that um, themselves. Paramo has gone off to take a call. Um, yes, please call her right now <laughs> um, while I run the show. Definitely call, donate, yeah, been, <laughs> you know. I've, I've been left, give I've to been these left folks. with all the messages blinging at me. So, uh, yeah, do your do your jobs. <laughs> um, and, uh, send no, that Mary. sounds good. I know. Oh, gosh, we have so many things going on. We've got all this help in the, in the background. Uh, these guys are keeping the show together. Um, so if you can send care. Well, I'm very impressed. Help. You guys have been doing this for over a day and you're still going strong so that is amazing so that's helping popsicles helping. <laughs> um so we are talking about growing up engaged in science so uh talking yes. about parenting with science and 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 how you get your kids to talk about science concepts and and their ideas um so why don't you just go ahead and and tell us who you are tell us about the work you do in in um, how to grow your geek and uh yeah go ahead with that Okay. Well, I'm Susie Murph. I podcast at How to Grow Your Geek, 
and it is usually an audio podcast, hence the fun of um, doing live video, because usually I can edit a little bit more and get them to, to talk, because it's really funny trying to get kids to talk right when you want them to. Yes. Um, <laughs> but we talk about all kinds of things, because I'm a big um, science, fantasy, sci-fi geek, and I think it's great fun to share all this stuff with my kids. Um, now, some of the stuff they love and some of the stuff they're like, gee, mom, come on. <laughs> but it's all about trying it all until you find out, you know, what strikes their interest and what inspires them to go and do stuff. I'm pretty happy that Kevin already has decided that he really likes life sciences and all. Oh, good. That makes me happy. And Amanda has gone through from wanting to be a marine biologist. I think now she's more looking at architecture, but it's still a really good, you know, mm -hmm. interesting technical career. And she's trying out different things. So that's, you know, what you want your kids to do. You want them to go and explore different options and find out what they're interested in and what they're good at. So just as parents, I believe that it's important for us to try to, you know, give them at least a little exposure to all these things. Not overbook them like crazy, but give <laughs> them time to uh, visit places that might be interesting to them. Like uh, we recently, right before the end of the space shuttle um, program, we went down to um, Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center and toured around there because I really wanted them to see it before it stopped functioning in that capacity anyway. And, uh, you know, they got to see the space shuttle up on the pad waiting to, to go off and, you know, see some of the history of the space program, too. I heard Amy share a title this morning talking about walking in and seeing the big Saturn V laying down there. Oh, my gosh. And it's amazing. And, you know, even my kids, you know, they may be arguing or something, but you walk into a building and all of a sudden there's this giant rocket and you're just walking and walking and walking yeah. and you're still yeah. under it. They're going to be pretty impressed, um, and you know it's hard to, it's hard for them to even you know tune out in the science when you've got that moment going on. Absolutely. So it's a lot of fun, you know, taking them places. I mean, I'm a big space geek, so they have to put up with me doing, mm -hmm. you know, being interested in a lot of this stuff. But uh, they're pretty game to go in and and try different things and and see all that. Plus, we went with. Um, my husband's parents and my husband's dad happened to be a aerospace engineer who worked on the engines, uh, the solid rocket boosters of the space shuttle. Oh, wow. So for him, it was really great and it was personal and he got started talking to the kids about what he worked on. So that made it even more interesting, I thought. Plus it was, you know, a good, a good way to connect with their grandfather. So that's awesome. that was, that was a lot of fun. Have we got Carrie in here now? I yeah. feel like I'm doing all the talking. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, Carrie, tell us Hi, a little Carrie. bit about yourself and your background. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, so I always wanted to be a meteorologist. Uh, my preschool was hit by a tornado, and I came home that day and said, Mom, I want to be a meteorologist, and continued along that path. And then it wasn't until high school when we happened to be in Florida and we saw STS-114 launch. And then I was like, well, I really want to do that. So I went to space camp twice, total geek there, loved it. And then I found out right before I started college that I could study weather on other planets. And I said, that's it. I know what I want to do. So um, I did that. And I went to Texas A&M. I got my bachelor's in meteorology, and I just defended my master's in atmospheric science here also. Woo! Yes. Yay. Congrats. Uh, Congratulations. That's a big oh, deal. <laughs> I believe it was a month ago yesterday that I defended. So I've been enjoying a little bit of time off. I went to a NASA social, things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, now I'm turning into my first, first author paper, which is pretty exciting. Very cool. And then... I, uh, about a week ago, accepted a job offer at JPL to be a mission operations engineer for the Dawn mission. Oh, welcome and join. Yay! Congrats. <laughs> so I'm oh, wearing I my uh, Surly Amy necklace. JPL tag here. Yes, so that is another Surly Ramix. As you can see, we love uh, Amy's jewelry around here. Uh, so congratulations. That is really, really cool. Um, 
So in addition to the, the, uh, the harrowing experience of your early childhood, uh, what else um, can you say really helped you to keep going with science uh, throughout, your, throughout your, your childhood and growing up? I definitely had a lot of supportive teachers, which was really nice. Um, so thank you to all of them. And uh, really just being able to read and study on my own. Um, I was homeschooled for fifth grade, and that's when I really developed how I could study and gain material just independently. And so I thought that was a really good experience. And uh, really just making sure that I was reading and kind of keeping up with things and, you know, always looking at the blogs and the books and whatever it is out there um, and trying to keep on top of everything that's going on in space because if you tell somebody that you work for NASA or you know yeah. you do this stuff they're like oh well you know what about this thing that's completely unrelated that you do so um, and a lot of that is why I landed working on Dawn and uh, all of my specialty is working on Mars spacecraft I've gotten to work on the Phoenix lander and Spirit and Opportunity and Curiosity and I actually work on Curiosity later this week um, but uh, you know because I've had all this experience and I was willing to you know learn about all these different things they were like oh sure come work for Dawn I was like okay <laughs> so uh, asteroids. yeah you know going from Mars rovers to asteroid orbiters totally big switch but uh, you know it'll be exciting and I like learning new things, so awesome. I have a lot to learn. <laughs> um, Susie, do you have any uh, early experiences that, that got you thinking about science and pushed you towards science? Oh, goodness. I think I was always a bit of a, a science geek, you know, techie geek, because I remember when we first got computers in the classroom. I'm a little older than you guys, so... I remember when we first got those computers, and I started um, learning how to do stuff on them, and that kind of triggered an interest in science and technology with me, and uh, I was, I, there was one particular experience that I really clearly remember that um, it wasn't exactly inspiring, but it was very memorable. And that was when I was in high school, and that was the, the first space shuttle uh, disaster. Mm -hmm. And we were yeah. sitting there, and we were doing a blood drive at school, and we were all watching it in the library. And so, you know, it's just one of those points that's fixed in your memory. But I remember it being so important to all of us that the space program not stop after that, that we keep going, because we knew we needed to explore, and we knew we needed to get back and to, to not let that stop us. And just kind of through my course, I ended up studying psychology in uh, college, and I did my master's program too, so I, I certainly understand what it's like going through the uh, de defending your thesis and stuff, so congratulations, Carrie. That's a big deal. Um, but I would have loved if there was a way to do psychology on uh, other people, other other races from somewhere else that would be really amazing so my the thing I would really like to do is right now considered science fiction um, kind of exo psychology but what is really fascinating to me is I've always just loved everything having to do with science and space and I've stayed a hobbyist in it even though I my career took me somewhere else and then now I'm mostly you know working with my kids and turned into a science educator informally if nothing else on uh, my podcast and I've got a surly today too I've got Ooh. my science surly and my bad astronomy surly right here Yay! so uh, that was I'm another a, fundraiser she did yes so I'm an enthusiastic hobbyist which um, basically, the point I'm, I make across that is no matter what you end up doing with, for your career, even if it's not in science or tech, uh, you can be a hobbyist all of your life, and you can really enjoy it and promote learning about science. And you know, given how important science and technology, engineering, and math is for the kids in the schools nowadays, it's a great thing to just kind of get your kids used to learning about and get them to enjoy the experiences of because it's going to be so important in careers in the future. What are we showing here? This is, oh! Uh, <laughs> got Carrie's images. Unfortunately, for some reason, it doesn't want to, like, be a normal size. So, we so, can see scroll. 
Carrie, do you remember when you and I first met? I do. LPSC you, 2008. Yeah, you were a baby undergrad wearing <laughs> your medals from space camp. And, and I remember that because I went to space camp too and got all those same medals. And I think you may be the only person I know who went more times than I did. And, and I only went twice, but... Yeah. Oh, then, then for some reason, over the years, I had multiplied the number of times you went because I went more than twice. <laughs> um, but it was, yeah, that was just really cool to me to see someone uh, so similar yet so very different who was, you were ahead of where I was at your age, and it was just kind of awe-inspiring to get to meet you. Um, and so, yeah, here are your pictures we see. Yeah. Um, can you explain why you have a red thing labeled blood on you? <laughs> yeah, so for the uh, two-week space camp mission, uh, at the very end, you have a 24-hour mission. And in this one, they can throw medical problems at you. And so our um, pilot ended up having a heart attack. Well, I had to try and reach forward during launch to uh, you know, hit all the switches so we could get into orbit. Well, in that process, I hit my head, and therefore blood started spewing out. And as a result, I gained OCD uh, to open and close drawers. So I opened up all the drawers, and they have these things called space ghosts. And so if there's a drawer open, they will start things to float out of the drawer. In other words, they throw everything everywhere. So for the entire mission, I was opening and closing drawers, and... Um, yeah, we paper toweled the entire model of the space shuttle. That was pretty fun. So, yeah, that, that's the story there. <laughs> that's awesome. So then, and, and and I've heard you're never too old to go to space camp. I, I never got to go, and and they they do have you it for adults, right? You should go with our teachers. This is a thing we're doing. The, the, the Boeing pays for a group of Metro East teachers <gasps> to go to space camp. Okay, we need to find a so way. So talk to staff. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you need to go. I want to go too. I want to go. Oh, it sounds like fun. I think they'll take us. <laughs> I grew up in Alabama and I still never got to go. My husband did. He grew up actually in Huntsville. So he got to go and he worked there when he was in um, high school. So I told, always told him I was jealous, and I want our kids to definitely get the chance to go over there because I never got to go, and it would be so much fun. We are three three hundred sixty four dollars away from paying one year of graduate student salary. Three hundred and sixty four dollars. And and Come on. I, we've had some really impassioned pleas in the comment threads from Nancy Graz and from Thomas, uh, saying, "Hey, just a dollar, you know, just a dollar." or just a retweet, or just a share to some friends, uh, that's going to help us out a lot. So cosmoquest.org slash donate, that's the link to go to to donate, uh, and, and share the YouTube link, share, share the cosmoquest.org uh, link as well. And, and Ryan, I'm flipping, I have like 20, it feels like, conversations open. Ryan, we know you're oh out there gosh, doing yeah. cards against astronomy. I want to print them out. Can you email them to me? Starstrider at gmail.com. Oh, email, he emailed them to me, and I emailed them to Corey. So should I forward them to you instead? Yeah, because the printer's right there, it okay, turns out. Okay, that works. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, and and so thank you, them. and all the rest of you. We want to spend our last hour playing cards against humanity. We're also going to have Sandy come in, tell us about um, Fame Lab and working at Arecibo to defend us from the evils of asteroids. We're hopefully going to have Stuart Foreman come in, join us with the sun. Um, so so donate and keep the science coming, but also keep the cards against astronomy coming. Uh, we want this to be a thing. I made cards against Mars. Ooh. Oh, can you send Ooh. us the files? Fun. Uh, I could probably send you some. There's some that shouldn't go outside the MSL science team. <laughs> That's fine. That's there's fine. We're good with that. that. We <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's ones in there like Curiosity Hopelessly Impaled on a Pointy Rock, and that one's from Doug Ellison. That's so. not as bad oh, as funny. some of the ones I'm seeing. Here. And then, of course, you know, we have plenty of Star Trek references like Captain Janeway with PMS and, you know, <laughs> So. <laughs> I, I met the actress who plays Captain Janeway once. That's a good story. <laughs> oh my god, I was so humiliated. So I, I'm one of these people that just, I'm okay with face recognition, but not 
great. And if it's a TV person out of context, I'm likely to embarrass myself. The first time I met Jamie Bamber, I had no clue who I was talking to, despite being the largest Battlestar Galactica fan there is. But he was scruffy. It turns out he's my height and very, very British. Um, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, but but so I, I was trying to organize getting some International Year of Astronomy stuff autographed by William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and I'd been told that their handler was about to come through a set of doors and I was waiting outside that set of doors for their handler and out comes this woman in a suit I didn't register the face I said excuse me are you the name of the handler and Katie looks at me and she goes no <laughs> and I had this moment of Oh, oh, and I fled, I fled, I hid, I hid from the entire Star Trek crew, the entire rest of that Dragon Con, I was humiliated, but um, yeah, so it was probably far more embarrassing to me than the story makes out, but I was humiliated by this, but I'm now rambling. Yeah, well, I got to play Cards Against Mars with Jerry Ryan at my apartment in Pasadena this past what? fall. <laughs> Sorry, what? Sorry, She seems... Is she really as cool in person as she seems on Twitter? Because I've seen her talking on there, and she seems like she would be the most laid-back, cool person ever. Yeah. she. So her husband's the chef, and I like cooking. So I was totally, like, freaking out. And ended up that she just wanted to eat my dinosaur chicken nuggets and sat on our floor and played Cards Against Humanity with us. Oh, my God. How awesome. Y'all are so hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I would... I wish I could trade places with you there, Carrie, because that all just all this stuff sounds so much fun. I would love to go to JPL and see all this stuff. I'm always watching when one of these landers is is landing. You know, one of these things is coming down on Mars. You can ask my kids. I stayed up and I was watching the Seven Minutes of Terror and everything. I was just sitting there gnawing my fingernails. So, just I want to come hang out at your house. That's what <laughs> yeah. come visit me at JPL. I'm moving there in like six weeks. I would love to. It would be so much fun. You just have this cra this this crazed, you know, suburban soccer mom going, This stuff is so cool. Oh That's me. We do it too. <laughs> it's okay. So so Ryan, just ask on YouTube, wait, wait, were these supposed to be family friendly? No, don't worry. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. We can go in it. <laughs> we, PG we, thirteen. Yeah, well and and if they're not PG thirteen, we're all clever enough to edit on the fly. Uh, so speak that we yourself. know what they say. <laughs> yeah, speak for yourself. You know how bad my filter is. <laughs> New Yorker. I'll just kind of wave it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so I family. know when to put the headphones on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so I, I have to, I'm the wrong person to talk to about raising people as geeks because I get kids <laughs> when they're 18 and they don't count as children anymore. I steal other people's offspring and turn them into scientists and engineers. Pablo doesn't know what to do with children because they have snot coming out of them. And they're That's little true. And yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yes. But yes. The, and I, I and mean, you won't, y'all probably wouldn't believe me when I say when it's your kid. It's a lot less gross. That's what it they just say. doesn't. It just doesn't. It doesn't register until you've had one, and then you're like, okay, I have to, you know. See, but yeah, somebody else's kid still kind of grosses me. <laughs> I know I have it bad when like uh, Tim's niece, you know, does baby spit up on my sweater, and I'm like, oh no, big deal. Oh, I'll go change her diaper. Blah blah blah. Uh, and I'm not freaked out by that, and that's not my yeah. kid. So I don't know what that says about me. I think no, that just means you're good with kids. That's a good to, sign. I'm to yeah. Produce at some point. I yeah, think. you're you're compensating for Kyle and I. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> not by number. I Hope. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it's definitely it's one of those things that um, there are all different kinds of parents in the world, and some just adore all the little baby stuff, and others are like me, and I like them when they're old enough to talk and do stuff with, and you don't have to you know wipe everything up after them all the time. I have way more fun with them at that point because you know you can do more stuff with them. So. This is the this is the age group I like. I've got them ten and thirteen now. So ooh, okay. Yeah, they they help a lot too, which is really nice. So. <laughs> is this the age where they stop asking the good questions though? Are yeah. You, what are you doing to stem the tide of? I'm a teenager now. I'm too cool. I don't want to ask questions. Well, one thing we really tried to do is make sure that um, you know all the 
try we've tried to let them ask all the questions that they want to ask now every now and then you do go all right enough just go to bed but um, generally if it's a good question we'll sit down and we'll actually answer and give them probably a much longer explanation than they want but we've just tried to foster this environment where they can ask anything and you know we kind of come up with it you know and I, I, it's a good thing Amanda's not sitting behind me because she'd probably be rolling her eyes right now uh, 13 year olds do that oh, yeah. um, but uh, They've been really good about still asking good questions because they know they're going to get an answer probably more than they want to know, but I believe in the more information, the better. So that's awesome. um, So they still ask, which I'm really happy about. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's the age where that starts to drop off. And uh, I see I, I work with, you know, groups of students and you, you see a sharp drop off like, Third grade, they're great. Fourth grade, they're great. Fifth grade, they're great. And they, you know, they're the peak of the asking questions and the knowledge. Yes. And then and if they're not in the right group after that, they start to slide off. And, and once they're in high school, you really got to drag it out of them <laughs> when they're yeah. in a group. Yeah, they're like, oh, too cool for school at that point. It, yeah. A lot of it has to do with, um, you know, number one, being engaged as a parent and having interesting things to talk to them about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're just talking about, you know, they're not that big into the news and politics and stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you have interesting things, like we had a really good discussion today at lunch about, you know, decisions coming through the Supreme Court and copyright law and how that applies to the happy birthday song, you know, Ooh. things like that. Um, if you've got interesting things to talk to them about, they often get engaged even when they're not trying to. And they start asking questions back. And also um, having really good teachers in their classrooms that keep them engaged and give them a lot of information that, you know, then they come home and they ask you about. Uh, that's a really good thing, too. And it, one way you can kind of see how engaged your teachers are is to go and help out at the school, help out in the classroom oh, yeah. and know your teachers and know what's going on in their classes. You have to ask a lot of questions yourself, so um, it's definitely not hands-off kind of parenting, but I think it really pays off because you're able to keep your kids talking about stuff. <laughs> Were you both the kind of kids that continued to ask questions and be geeky even through your teens? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? I know I was an obnoxious geek all throughout, Yeah, even though I rolled I... my eyes. <laughs> I basically said, I don't care what other people think of me, and I want to know what's going on, so I'm going to ask the questions. Um, so I, I totally asked questions and did whatever, and I, I try and tell that when I'm talking to high school kids. I'm like, really, even next year, they're not going to remember that you asked the question, but you're going to remember what you learned. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, you may be embarrassed or whatever, and they may laugh at you for five minutes, even if it's a dumb question, and there really isn't any dumb questions, but... Yeah, you know, they won't remember. So, you know, do the benefit for yourself. Yeah, so I was. I, I'd like to share. We've gotten okay. thirty-five more dollars in donations. We are now at fourteen thousand six hundred and sixty-nine. We are still not at a feed the Joe level. Feed Joe. Come on, all the dads out there for Father's Day, give instead of receiving a little bit. Give a little bit to these folks because they do a fantastic job providing educational opportunities. So that's my plea anyway <laughs> to all the dads that I've talked to today. Guido says, uh, I don't have children, but I still feel like a kid myself. Then again, everybody does or should. And I think that's something that science uh, brings is you get that sense of wonder uh, no matter what age you are. And that gives you the feeling like you're, you're still a kid discovering things again. Can you share the rest of the comment tracker? What do you mean? Go scroll down? No, no, no. I'm only getting Oh, you YouTube. want the link. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know that's definitely the way I feel. I still feel like I'm a big kid just, you know, right up here. And sometimes I'm surprised. I look around and I'm like, I've got kids. I've got to take care of myself. Oh, goodness. <laughs> but it, it really does help to, um, to keep you interested and engaged in stuff that's going on to have that sense of wonder. Um, you know, when when you go in and you see something like the Saturn V rocket, it's pretty amazing to stand up there and look up at it. So it's, I think that really helps, and I think that 
there are a lot of us, especially the folks that tend to be geeky, we still have that very much that sense of wonder. Oops, sorry, I'm get, still getting all the things here. Are you queuing something up? Um, no, I'm. I was just trying to figure out where the <laughs> uh, in the chat up here, the chat in the hangout. Oh, for some reason I didn't get a blue number. Now I see it. Okay. Sorry, we're Excellent. still trying to do all the things. <laughs> Ooh, it's four one four. I don't even know what a four one four is. Okay. Okay, don't worry about it. I will simply lean over your shoulder. Okay. <laughs> So we um, we are going to have we have been subjecting everyone to death by puppets the entire show because really death by puppets, um, and we have them slated for their own fifteen minute segment next. But we have a great no, opportunity. We, don't. we have Ryan Lynch next. Sorry, we have after <laughs> Ryan, after Ryan, after uh, Jeff Nocum. We have uh, a fifteen minute segment dedicated to death by puppets. Um, but instead, I'm going to replace it out with Sandy, who's going to come to us and do her Fame Lab spiel, and it is a fabulous one. So I'm going to edit the schedule to reflect that. And uh, yeah, we're having a, a <laughs> we're having a great set of guests. We are so amazingly pleased that we've had so many people. We've gotten 15 more dollars in donations. We are now at 14,684. Uh, thank you. That thank you. <laughs> um. So, Susie, maybe. Uh, okay, silent puppet. Uh, Susie, do you, um, what do you do, to, uh, and, and uh, I guess we can all talk about our own experiences or experiences with kids. Uh, what kind of um, activities do you take your kids to, or do they take you to uh, where they can learn more about science? Well, we definitely go and do all kind of the, the normal science-y things. We go and visit the museums. Um, but what we typically look for is when they're having some kind of special activity, like... Um, uh, we have a science museum nearby that's called the TELUS Museum, and I think Pamela's been over there, and I know I just recently met Jeff Notkin over there, and it's in North Georgia, and they have an observatory. And so a lot of times they'll have a night where you can come out and you can go and look at the observatory, and that's one of the things we're actually planning on doing at some point. We haven't made it over there at night yet, but another really cool thing that we have done definitely I, you always have the list of the things you want to do and the list that you haven't done you know that you haven't done yet or that you want to get to um, another thing was our uh, natural history museum here in Atlanta Fernbank Museum had an exhibit and it was um, mythical monsters and one of our our uh, podcasting friends, Dr. Atlantis, from the Monster Talk podcast. We know Dr. Atlantis. Yes, <laughs> um, Blake Smith. And yeah. He was over there, and he did a tour through the, um, the Mythological Monsters exhibit, and he was talking about kind of the factual base of the monsters and how the kind of the myths came up. And so we went, we took that special tour with him going through there, and you know that it was much more interesting than just walking through the exhibit and looking at it and that really helped because the kids really enjoy um, mythology books they're big fans of the um, the Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief series you know with all the Greek mythology so there were a lot of those monsters and stuff that were in there and then we could talk about the real animals that kind of inspired it so anytime you can find something that's like at a museum or a science center or something near you that has an added uh, program or something extra, or something fun or more interactive. Those are yet really good things to go and do because it kind of gives you a little more than just the walking through the exhibit. Mm -hmm. And other things that we tend to do is we either what I grew up on a farm in South Alabama, and you can imagine the skies there are beautifully dark oh at gosh. night. We're out in the boonies, and uh, we live in Atlanta, so in Atlanta we have tons of light pollution but when we go down there we tend to try to either take our binoculars or our Galileo scope and go out and try to look at things and we've also got our iPads with our um, uh, our Star Walk programs and stuff and we go outside and do that 
which is a lot of fun. And I mean, it's gorgeous and dark, and you can see everything. You can even see, you know, the band of the of the Milky Way. It's absolutely gorgeous to go and do that, and that doesn't cost anything except just being there. Um, let's see, what else do we do? We do a lot of talking about stuff. I, I know y'all can't imagine me talking. I know it's hard to a podcast to imagine a podcaster. Um, we watch a lot of sci-fi and then talk about it. Nice, uh, that's what I that's, did growing up. Yeah, it's just it's a lot of fun, and sometimes we and it doesn't have to be good sci-fi. You sometimes you can talk <laughs> a lot about the really bad sci-fi. Mm -hmm. And why is that, you know, why does that not make sense? And, oh, my gosh, you know, in, in something like Revolution, no, the power really wouldn't go off that way. We've had tons of long conversations. And, you know, it gets them interested, gets them engaged. They have a perspective that, you know, they want to share. And we have factual information and our own opinions that we can talk about there, too. So... Those are the kind of things we do, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I had a less I had a less geeky childhood, definitely in terms of sci-fi, uh, and and my mom ha didn't have a background in science at all, but saw my interest in it and and just bought me every book possible <laughs> that, yeah. that had to do with science. And that, and you know she this was in the age before Google, and I asked why about everything, and so and I, I asked her recently. I said, so what did you do? I asked you why, why, why. And you didn't have a background in science, and you saw me having this interest. I wanted to be an astronaut when I was five, and, you know, that was it. I was set. Um, and she's like, we took you to the library. Remember that place with all the <laughs> dead tree things with the words on them? That place uh, with all the books? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, not so... Barnes & Noble? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> you can take them, but you have to bring them back? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah, that was my that was my experience was uh, a lot of um, books through my mom. <laughs> That's what my parents did with me. We did, you know, they they bought me books. Um, they let me watch pretty much uh, anything sci-fi that was on. I was I was able to watch. I was an only, so I didn't have to argue or fight with anybody. They just usually let me um, watch whatever was on. You know, if it was Battlestar Galactica or whatever. You know, that was my favorite. It. Yes. Had the big crush on Starbuck back then, with the hair, um, with the hair exactly, the hair. <laughs> and and then just yeah, going to the library and reading a lot of books um, because I was out on a farm out in the middle, you know, in, in South Alabama, and there wasn't a ton of sciencey stuff. There weren't really you know cool camps and things, so uh, they just let me read lots of stuff, yeah. which was really cool. So uh, we are wrapping up this segment in a few minutes. Um, I want to know if you each have any uh, last bit of advice for uh, inspiring the, the younger generation. This is very corny. Inspiring the children of tomorrow um, into science or um, cultivating their natural curiosity. So uh, Carrie, you want to give, give a shot at that? Um, I'm totally going to plug SEDS here. Um, SEDS is the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. Uh, it's mostly, well, it's an international organization, but I can only really talk about the USA chapter since that's what I'm familiar with. Um, and then within SEDS USA, we have college campuses and high school campuses all across the country. Um, I was the president of Texas A&M SEDS for many, many years. And um, you'll find each group kind of has their own flavor. Uh, when I originally joined, all it was was upper-level aerospace students complaining about their classes. And I was like, let's do something better than that. Yeah, uh, so way. I brought in people to talk about astronomy. And I brought in a guy who was growing plants in low-oxygen environments, trying to simulate microgravity. You know, how does that affect plants? You know, try to really diversify the group. Um, and because we're so close to Houston, we're only about two hours away from Johnson Space Center, uh, we actually have a lot of astronaut kids in our group, and so we've been able to get some astronauts in and talk to the students, Excellent. too, so that's been really fun. Um, and, you know, if you go, all the different chapters have their own themes. University of Central Florida is like 100 aerospace engineers, and they build their own rockets. Um, if you go to the University of Arizona, it's mostly astronomy and optical engineers, and they build their own telescope every year. Mm -hmm. And, cool. you know, you have this very diverse group, but we all get together. We have a national conference every year. Um, this year it's at uh, Arizona State. It's usually around uh, sometime in, like, late October, early November time frame. 
And so if you're a student who has any interest in talking to people in various aspects of space, definitely go to Space Vision. Uh, it's a lot of fun. The first time I ever went was actually when we hosted it, and I was helping to host it. And uh, the after parties are totally worth it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So, uh, and I think they're about to do a big rocketry competition across Ooh. the different chapters. So if you have any interest in rockets, join your local chapter. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Susie, do you have any, any parting shots about uh, engaging kids' natural curiosity? Well, I would say definitely with the younger ones, just let them explore. Turn them loose in the backyard and let them flip over rocks and find what's under them. Take them out and show them the stars at night. You know, they're natural scientists, so you know, just kind of encourage that, give them the opportunity to do that. And then as they get older, give them books and TV shows and movies and all kinds of stuff to inspire them and give them creative ideas. And I think you'll be amazed. You know, they'll find something they really, really like in there and just be available to ask, answer questions and just give them those kind of resources and be willing to talk about stuff and listen. Um, I don't do that enough. My kids will probably be telling you. But I try. I try really hard, and that's the best you can do is try to listen and have conversations with them about stuff. So that's my best advice there. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much you. for joining us um, for the Cosmo Quest Hangout a thon. Uh, it was so good to see you guys. Yes. Uh, and I know Susie will probably see you at Dragon Con. Yes. Yay! You'll yes. see us there, and, and I'll probably pitch in and help at the booth again, too. Because that's a lot of fun. And Carrie, hopefully, we'll see you at LPSC yet again. Hopefully, yeah. I, I think I'm turning more into an engineer now than a scientist, but uh, they've promised me that I can talk to uh, or look at the science data for Dawn and do whatever I want with it, so maybe. I know well, you know, we kind of have the citizen science project called mm -hmm. Asteroid Mappers that just might have a little <laughs> oh, yeah. to do with the Dawn mission. <laughs> so you've always got a place here to come hang out. Excellent. So thank you so much, and uh, for those of you just tuning in and unsure what you just stumbled into, <laughs> uh, this is the CosmoQuest 24-hour, but really 32-hour uh, Hangout-a-thon to raise money for public engagement in science. We are bringing you 32 straight hours of science-related content, art, conversation, and uh, we're even going to be playing Cards Against Astronomy in our final hour and uh, working backwards for the rest of the day. We have Cards Against Astronomy. We have Sandy and the Baby Avocado coming on to talk about when asteroids approach. We have Beyond the Wall, and we're going to try and sort out this crazy, crazy weather system they have in Westeros. We have Jess Nokum coming in, one of the meteorite men, and now we have... Right.